I'm Daniel, this is Asheville, and today we're showcasing the world's biggest self-discharging bulk carrier ship. I'm in Glen Sander on the west coast of Scotland. It's a mineral-rich location that has reserves for the next 100 years. It's owned and operated by Aggregate Industries. It's a dream come true for the construction industry. It means we have a long-lasting supply of material so we can continue to build, improve, and expand. There's one problem. You can only get to Glen Sander by sea. So you can't send in trucks and distribute by road, and you can't connect to rail line and use freight services. So what do you do? You build the world's biggest self-discharging bulk carrier ship at the cost of 70 million pounds. Meet the Yeoman Bridge. A self-discharging ship is a vessel capable of discharging its own cargo. This is important as it can quickly and safely discharge goods without the receiving ports needed expensive and large infrastructure or machines. Generally, in cases where a vessel cannot self-discharge, a purpose-built machine would need to reach from land or track onto the vessel and handle the offload. However, you don't just build one, because it would get lonely. You build two. Her sister, the Yeoman Bontrump, is currently on the way to Amsterdam. They are 249.9 meters long, 38 meters wide, and weigh 26,186 tons empty. That is very similar to the famous Titanic, which was 269 meters long and 28 meters wide. were built in 1991 and have an economical life expectancy of 40 years. Knowing the size and weight of the ship, I need to see right away what's powering it. The engine is a Kawasaki 20,940 brake horsepower. It's split over four levels. This is made up of injectors, pistons and valves. What you can see over here is the main shaft what takes the power to the propeller. The ship uses heavy fuel oil. Heavy fuel oil, known as HFO, is a category of fuel oil, also known as bunker fuel or residual fuel oil. It is the result or remnant of the distillation and cracking process of petroleum. Now the exhaust from this is passed through a scrubber. The scrubber's filtration system injects baking soda into the exhaust gases. This reacts with the sulfur and carbon. It neutralizes most of the harmful gases and the cleaned air is exhausted. While at sea, this burns 30 metric tons of fuel a day, and while at port, discharging 12 metric tons a day. The ship has a cruising speed of 11.5 knots, and it has a top speed of 15 knots, which is about 17 miles per hour. This is a little bit slower than a cruise ship or a container ship, which has a top speed of 20 knots, which is 23 miles an hour. The area in the belly of the ship where the material is stored is called the hold. The ship has five separate holds, which are numbered from front to back. Each hold is covered by two hatches. To open the hatches, there's a custom gantry crane, permanently fixed to the ship on rails, which moves from front to back. The crane manually lifts the hatches and stacks them on deck level between the holds. The maximum load it can carry is 97,000 tons. Now, this is nearly equivalent to 5,300 eight-wheel tipper loads. It takes 24 hours to load the ship, but the loading has to be planned with the tide. The average load is 85,000 tons. When the tide is out, the depth here is 12.3 meters. When the tide comes in, it's 16 meters, where the ship sits 14 meters below sea level. So the heavy loading towards the end is always done when the tide has come back in. 
To prepare for the tide and plan accordingly, the data can be found on the UK Hydrographic Office website. They publish tide times based on lunar activity. The material being loaded here is a granite, which has been extracted and processed into a range of smaller sizes for transportation. Here we can see the ship load up. It moves on a rail system, which means it can move left and right. It moves up and down and in and out. This means the ship can stay completely stationary. Everything is controlled from the control room here, which is called the crow's nest. When it's time to load, the discharge conveyor is pointed out to sea, so not to get in the way. Loading the ship is all about balancing the weight evenly, taking into account all factors including fuel. The ship is made of steel and therefore could under strain develop stress fractures. Uneven loading could also affect the maneuverability and performance of the ship. Too much material at either end and the ship could snap, too much material in the middle and the ship could sag. So a computer system which has been specifically designed for the ship is used to input all data and provide guidance on loading. No hold is completely loaded with material at one time. It is a gradual process with the shitloader continually moving between the holds, adding material to each as the ship needs to be balanced throughout the loading process. The shiploader provides readings on the weight of the material loaded and this is manually cross-referenced on the side of the ship. The draft mark acts like a ruler. It measures how much of the ship is in the water. The information enables a cross-reference of data between the loading system and the ship itself, which feeds into the computer and provides an accurate reading. Close to the end of the loading process, the top-ups to each of the holds are called trimming. These are small adjustments to finalize the balancing of the ship. On an average voyage with an 85,000 ton payload, the rough distribution between the holds is 17,000 tons in hold one, 18,500 in hold two, 18 and a half thousand in hold three, between 14,000 and 15,000 in hold four, and between 15,000 and 17,000 in hold five. Collectively, the ships move between six and seven million tons from Glensander a year. Now these go to a variety of countries like the United Kingdom, Belgium, France, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Poland, and Latvia. To give you an idea of travel times, it takes two days and three hours to get to the Isle of Grain, and it takes two days and six hours to get to Amsterdam. The ship's crew is made up of about 31. Now that consists of the captain, engineers, officers, and the support crew who handle all the welfare and maintenance. And of course, my favorite person on any voyage, the chef. This is where the chief engineer sits. Here he can monitor all the pressures and temperatures which come from the engine. And over here, this is where he applies the power. I'm up in the bridge. Here we have the navigation, we have the radar, we have the captain's control of the thrusters and the captain's control of the engine. Over here is the steering wheel. We have more radar here. On my left, we have emergency communication. Over here, we have the navigation lights and here we have all the onboard lights. The bridge will normally be manned by a team of three, a junior officer who's on the steering wheel taking instructions from the captain, the pilot who navigates the ship and provides the captain with information, and the captain who uses all the information provided by his entire team, including the chief engineer and has overall control and responsibility of the ship. Should the worst happen, we have two lifeboats. Each can house 40 people, one on the port side, one on the starboard side. Maintenance on the ship is ongoing the entire time. However, twice in a five-year period, the ship is taken out of commission and put in a dry dock. The parts of the ship below sea level are inspected, repaired, and it gets a new lick of paint. Each service costs somewhere in the region of two million pounds. The material is processed and stockpiled in preparation for the vessel arrival. Beneath the stockpile are multiple trap doors. The material falls onto a conveyor belt, which takes it to the shiploader. The ship is fully loaded with 85,000 tons of material. The tide is in and the ship is ready to depart.
At the Isle of Grain, there is restricted maneuverability due to the size of the ship and limited space. There is a flow of water in the area as a river joins nearby. When it rains upriver, this flow is increased significantly, making the task even more difficult. The ship losing control could have catastrophic consequences, so tugboats step in to assist. The process is called mooring, and the tugboats push, pull, and guide the ship into place. Due to the size of the jetty, the mooring points, which are where you tie down the lines, are not accessible by land. So a line boat steps in to take the lines to a point which is called a dolphin, and the ship is secured. The hold of the ship where the material is stored is a box shape with a V. There are three main conveyor belts running under the holds, which run from the front to the back of the ship. The central conveyor runs directly, and the outer conveyors are met by cross conveyors, which funnel all the material to a lift conveyor, which scoops the material and takes it to the discharge conveyor. The material is discharged at 6,000 tons an hour. The Yeoman Bridge and Yeoman Bond Trump were designed and built specifically for this application and work in tandem continuously. Without these engineering marvels, it simply would not be possible to transport this amount of material and self-discharge. This material will be stockpiled and further processed, where it will then be distributed by road, rail, and sea. This is a fantastic example of how human ingenuity and engineering have come together to support international infrastructure. If we can't get there by road, air or rail, we'll build a ship. If there's billions of tons to shift, we'll build a bigger ship. If offloading is a challenge and expensive, we build a self-discharge system. Thanks for watching and let us know what engineering marvels you'd like to see next. A special thank you and congratulations to Aggregate Industries for granting us access and creating this engineering masterpiece.